Hello, this is a video introducing you to the hyperbolic functions, and specifically we will discuss differentiating and integrating them. First off, the hyperbolic functions, whereas regular trig functions come from a unit circle, these hyperbolic trig functions, as they're known as, come from the unit hyperbola. If you do want to figure out more information about this or would like to explore it, feel free to look on the internet. But for the sake of this course, it's just important that you know that they exist and that you know that they have derivatives and they have antiderivatives or integrals. <clears throat> so this is the shape of hyperbolic sine, hyperbolic cosine, and hyperbolic tangent. These shapes probably look familiar or look similar to other graphs that you've seen in algebra or pre-calculus courses. Then we have hyperbolic cotangent, hyperbolic secant, and we have hyperbolic cosecant. So what's the purpose of these functions? Well, one such purpose, for instance, could be a cable suspending from two towers. This cable that is being suspended from two towers actually takes the shape of the hyperbolic cosine function. So that's one practical application. Now the actual definitions or relationships for hyperbolic functions. If you look at sine, hyperbolic sine, hyperbolic sine by definition is actually e to the x minus e to the negative x over 2. Hyperbolic cosine is e to the x plus e to the negative x over 2. And there's actual other definitions for the other hyperbolic functions in terms of the natural log, but for the sake of this course, tangent, for instance, is still sine over cosine, cosecant still 1 over sine, secant 1 over cosine, and cotangent 1 over tangent. And of course, that's all hyperbolic in those functions. So understand that sine h of x or sine hx is read as the hyperbolic sine of x. Some people will simply just say cinch. And for hyperbolic cosine, some people will just say cosh. Now as we work these examples, feel free to watch and listen first and then you can pause the video to write your work down if that's what you would prefer. So the cool thing about hyperbolic functions is that they behave very similar to regular trig functions. Not exactly the same, but very similar. So for instance, if hyperbolic tangent is one half, find hyperbolic cosine and find hyperbolic sine. So we start with an identity, and this can be found in your book at the very beginning of the section within the first page or two. So one identity says that hyperbolic tangent squared of x plus hyperbolic secant squared of x is equal to 1. Yes, this is one of the Pythagorean identities, or very similar to one of the Pythagorean identities, I should say. <clears throat> so I have 1 half squared plus secant, hyperbolic secant squared of x is equal to 1. When we square the half, we do get a fourth. When we take away a fourth from both sides, we are literally left with hyperbolic secant squared of x equals 3 fourths. And we'll square root both sides, leaving us with square root of 3 over 2 as hyperbolic secant. Now you have to understand that hyperbolic secant is the reciprocal of hyperbolic cosine. So if we flip hyperbolic secant, that's how we get hyperbolic cosine. <clears throat> now to find hyperbolic sine. To find hyperbolic sine, we use the identity hyperbolic tangent is equal to hyperbolic sine over hyperbolic cosine. So this means 1 half is equal to hyperbolic sine over 2 over the square root of 3. Since you're dividing by 2 over square root of 3, you would undo this by multiplying both sides by 2 over square root of 3. This leaves us with 1 over square root of 3 is equal to hyperbolic sine of x. Part B. If hyperbolic sine of x is equal to 2 fifths, let's find hyperbolic cosine and hyperbolic tangent. So we start with an identity. This is not the same as the Pythagorean identity. It's actually hyperbolic cosine minus hyperbolic sine is equal to 1. Cosine squared, sine squared. 
I plug in two fifths for hyperbolic sine. So I get hyperbolic cosine squared of x minus 2 over 5 squared is equal to 1. So this turns out to being subtracting 4 over 25 from hyperbolic cosine squared is equal to 1. After you add 4 over 25 to both sides, you do get hyperbolic cosine squared of x is equal to 29 over 25. You square root both sides, and you'll get square root of 29 over 5 as hyperbolic cosine. And now to find tangent, well, we know that hyperbolic tangent is equal to hyperbolic sine over hyperbolic cosine. We know that this is 2 fifths stacked over square root of 29 over 5. And then we get hyperbolic tangent is 2 over square root of 29. I'm not really too picky about whether you rationalize this or not. It's completely up to you. As long as I know how you know how you know how to use the hyperbolic functions to find other ones, you're good to go. Now, the derivatives and integrals. Remember I told you previously that the hyperbolic functions behave similar to the trig functions. Not exactly the same, but pretty similar. So the derivative of sine is actually cosine. The derivative of the hyperbolic cosine is actually just sine. And this u prime here is just saying, hey, take the derivative of the inside of the function because of the chain rule. And I'm not going to read through the whole list for you, but some other things. You can look at the antiderivative of cosine, hyperbolic cosine of u is equal to hyperbolic sine of u plus c. E. The antiderivative of hyperbolic sine of u with respect to u is hyperbolic cosine of u plus c. E. So you don't actually have that negative sign here like you would normally have for a regular trig function. So that's one difference. And then you have the rest of the antiderivatives. I do not require that you memorize these, but you should know how to use them. So example two, let's differentiate y equals hyperbolic cosine of 8x plus 1. So to take the derivative, we have y prime equals the derivative of hyperbolic cosine is hyperbolic sine, and then you keep your inside 8x plus 1. <clears throat> because you had something other than x within the function, it's your job by the chain rule to take the derivative of that inside block or that inside piece. So this means that we have hyperbolic sine of 8x plus 1 times 8. That times 8 does not multiply with the inside of the function. It always goes out front of the function. So y prime equals 8 hyperbolic sine of 8x plus 1. <clears throat> now, in part b, you have natural log of hyperbolic tangent of x over 2. <clears throat> this is actually going to be a triple chain rule because nested within natural log is hyperbolic tan. Nested within hyperbolic tan is x over 2. Remember what the chain rule is like. It's like peeling the layers of the onion. You start with the outermost function first and work your way inside. So we begin by taking the derivative of natural log. So when we take the derivative of natural log, it's 1 over what's inside. It's 1 over hyperbolic tan of x over 2. But then, because you had something inside the natural log other than x, you have to take the derivative of that inside piece. You have to take the derivative of hyperbolic tangent of x over 2. So what this gives us is we still have our 1 over hyperbolic tangent of x over 2, but now we have hyperbolic secant squared of x over 2, but then since there's something inside the function other than x, since there's something inside that hyperbolic function other than x, we have to take the derivative of that inside. We have to take the derivative of the x over 2, which does end up giving us just a half. So at the end of the day, when we put all this together, we get hyperbolic secant squared of x over 2 over 2 hyperbolic tangent of x over 2. So that's the final answer we will use. <clears throat> but wait, there's a little bit more here. Part C, f of x equals x squared times hyperbolic sine of x plus hyperbolic cotangent of 6x. 
So first, to differentiate the x squared times hyperbolic sine of x, we have to use the product rule. We have to take the first factor, which is x squared, and multiply it by the derivative of the second factor. That's the derivative of hyperbolic sine of x. So the first times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first. That's x squared times hyperbolic cosine of x plus hyperbolic sine of x times 2x. So this gives us x squared hyperbolic cosine of x plus 2x hyperbolic sine of x. To take the derivative of hyperbolic cotangent of 6x, we will use the chain rule. What is the derivative of hyperbolic cotangent? Well, it's negative hyperbolic cosecant squared of 6x, and take the derivative of that 6x afterwards. So the chain rule does produce a factor of 6. Remember that 6 does not multiply with the inside of the function. It goes out front of the function. So we have negative 6 hyperbolic cosine squared of 6x. There should actually be an h here. It's there now. Putting this all together gives me the derivative of x squared hyperbolic cosine of x plus 2x hyperbolic sine of x minus 6 hyperbolic cosine squared of 6x. So that's differentiating the hyperbolic functions. Well, what about integrating? So now we'll integrate, and yes, we'll be using a lot of u substitution here. So they give me the find the antiderivative or integrate hyperbolic cosine of 2x times hyperbolic sine squared of 2x with respect to x. <clears throat> so I'm going to start off with the substitution let u equal hyperbolic sine of 2x. The derivative of u with respect to x is hyperbolic cosine of 2x, and then the chain rule produces an additional factor of 2. So after a little bit of rearrangement, we're able to obtain that du over 2 is equal to hyperbolic cosine of 2x dx. All right, so looking at our question here, I have my hyperbolic cosine of 2x and dx, which will be replaced with du over 2. Then I have my hyperbolic sine squared of 2x, which I will replace that with u. It will become u squared. u squared du over 2. This means I have to have 1 half and then find the antiderivative or integrate u squared with respect to u. Becomes u cubed over 3. The half is still out front. Replacing u back to being in terms of x, I have 1 over 6. 2 times 3 gives me 6. Hyperbolic sine cubed of 2x plus c. It's an indefinite integral, therefore we must have the plus c. Indefinite means I have no bounds of integration. <clears throat> All right, one last one. <clears throat> so for u substitution, we would usually set u equal to the inside of the function. So let me just go out on a limb here and let u equal the square root of x, which is x to the half. The derivative of u with respect to x is 1 half x to the negative 1 half. So a little bit of rearranging, we can move that x to the negative 1 half to the bottom of the fraction. It becomes positive half. And then this will become du equals 1 over 2 square root of x followed by dx. Now, I know that after rearranging, 2du is equal to 1 over square root of x dx. I like this. I like the 1 over square root of x dx because <clears throat> look at our, our integral here. I have my square root of x on the bottom and dx. That can be replaced with 2du. In hyperbolic cosine, I have my square root of x. That can be replaced simply with u. All right, so looking at this, I now have my integral rewritten as hyperbolic cosine of u times 2 du. That's 2 times the antiderivative or integral of hyperbolic cosine of u with respect to u. That is, using our integration formulas for hyperbolic functions, 2 times hyperbolic sine of u. Putting the integral back in terms of x, we will get 2 times hyperbolic sine of square root of x, that's what u is, plus c. 
because it is an, it is an indefinite integral. So that's all I have for you now. I hope you enjoyed. Thanks for watching.